Hey everyone, welcome back to I Teach You Science. Today we are doing another set of cluster questions. It's going to be focusing on the weather standards in the Earth and Space Science Unit. This, these are not official cluster questions. I was shared this document. So this is another teacher who made these questions and I thank that teacher because a lot of these questions are really good practice. So we'll go through them. There's no document that is gonna be able to be followed along on your end. So what you're gonna have to do is just follow along with me and then pause the video before I answer the question, answer it and then see how you did. That's what I think you should do. If you have any friends you could please share this video to or your teacher, that would be awesome. We wanna be able to help as many people as we can study for this exam. All right, here we go. It says, base your answers to question 48 through 53 on the information below and Earth and Space Science. It says, tornadoes are rotating columns of air that are produced during strong thunderstorms. Tornadoes are among the most violent type of storm that we experience. There are about 1,200 tornadoes recorded in the United States each year, but them, the majority of them occur in the middle part of the country, and you could see classic tornado alley here. This is going to be the zone where the tornadoes form. So it says 33 tornadoes touched down in a span of three days. These tornadoes touched down in several states. There's those main states. These events supported a report that was published only a year before when two United States Air Force meteorologists conducted a survey on the area to experience severe weather. They called it Tornado Alley. Okay, so it says, why do tornadoes tend to form in this area more than the rest of the country? The Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees with respect to its axis. This along with the curve affects the way sunlight strikes the image, uh, the surface, then they have image here. Okay, so that's the, another question. So let's start with this one. So why do tornadoes tend to form in this area more than the rest of the country? So really this is pure content, which kind of makes it a little difficult because there's really nothing up here in this reading here that's gonna help you with this. The reason that tornadoes form in this area is because it's a collision of two really common air masses that form in the United States and are dragged over the United States because of different wind belts. So in Canada, up here above the United States, continental polar air is forming. So that's CP air. That means it's really dry and really cold. Continental means dry and polar means cold. So we call it CP. The CP air moves in this direction over the course of time over the United States. Down here, to the left of Florida, in the Gulf, there is maritime tropical air mass because that is a, this zone here is really really a lot of moisture and warm because it's down by Florida and what happens is this MT air mass that forms in the Gulf ends up coming up into the center of the United States and the collision of the CP and the MT air mass in this zone creates a spiraling effect and can cause severe tornadoes. Of course there's tornadoes that spawn all over the country but this is where they tend to spawn most often because of this effect so the answer here is going to be the cp air from canada and the mt air from the gulf collide that's, I'll leave it at that. Keep it simple. All right, so we have our Earth's tilt here, and it's saying that the tilt of the Earth is going to make the sunlight hit the Earth differently. So at the equator, this is a very direct ray of sunlight because it's not spread out. You can see the box on there is just in this zone, but this area is more spread out up here. So this is indirect. So the sunlight, direct versus indirect, is going to make hot temperatures versus cold temperatures. So you can imagine a side view, right? So a direct ray would be the sun's really high up in the sky and the sunlight comes straight down. It makes like a 90 degree angle with the ground. This would be like at the equator. And then at the 75 degrees north, up at almost by the North Pole, if you're there, the sun's really low in the sky. So the sun comes in at an angle and the heat like spreads out across the ground. So it doesn't heat up one area very much. This, all the heat is directed in one spot because it's 90 degrees above. So this is going to generate hot temperatures and this is going to generate cool to cold temperatures. In this case, it's very cold because it's way up north. So that's what this probably, this is going to be about because that's the only reason why they would show that. 
So it says, which road correctly identifies the cause and effect relationship of the angle the sunlight strikes the Earth's surface and the resulting temperature of the air masses above the Earth? Okay. So we want A to be direct. So look, at position A, sunlight is striking the surface directly. So is that right? No. We want C to be direct. So this is wrong. At position A, sunlight is striking the surface indirectly. Yes. Causing the energy from the sun to spread out over a large area. Yes. We're not going to do the effects until the end. We're going to get rid of these ones. At position B, the sunlight is striking the surface indirectly. Yeah, technically causing the energy to spread out over a larger area. Okay, I mean, this one's like medium indirectly, so this could be right. At position B, the sunlight is striking directly. No. C, striking indirectly. No. C, striking directly. Yes. So now we're between... B, C, and F. So now we're going to read the effect of each. So this one says, since it's indirect at A, double checking that, yeah, the surface would have less energy to transfer the air mass and therefore the temperature would be cooler. That could be correct. So we like B. This one, indirectly at B, the surface would have less energy to transfer the air mass so it would be warmer. No. Less energy means colder. So C is now out. And now hopefully F is out. The surface would have more energy to transfer the air masses and therefore it would be warmer. Choose all that apply. So the answer is B and F. The air at the equator rises and the air at the pole sink. Graph one shows the relationship between density and temperature. So before I even look at the graph with density and temperature, you have to know heat rises. So hot equals low density. So that's going to be like a graph if it's temperature and density. As temperature goes up, density goes down. So that's what we should see. See? Yeah, good. So that's right. How does the te relationship between air temperature and density explain the movement of air at the equator at the pole? So since the equator is really hot and the North Pole is really cold and the South Pole is really cold, the air should be rising at the equator and sinking at the poles. So let's read which one that is. At lower temperatures, air is less dense and sink. No, it's not less dense, it's more dense. So that's wrong. Air at lower temperatures, oh, at lower temperatures, air is more dense and rises. No, you can't be more dense and rise. At higher temperatures, like the equator, air is less dense and rises. Yes, since the air at the equator is warmer, it will rise. This is correct. So let's see four. At higher temperatures, air is more dense and sinks. No. So the answer is three. Image three shows the major air masses around North America. In the model, A, B, and C represent three masses that affect tornado formation in the Tornado Alley region. Okay, it's naming these. So it here's all your air mass name. So I can go through these real quick. So continental means dry. Tropical means warm. So this is dry. Arctic means very cold. Continental means dry. Polar means just cold. Maritime means uh, moist. And then tropical means warm. Maritime means a lot of moisture. Equatorial means very hot. That's like equator temperatures. Maritime means moist, and polar means cold. So that's about where they are. So this is North America right here. So if you divide this, it's generally all cold here, very cold up here, and then down here is hot, and down here is very hot. I'm talking about going left to right on these in these zones. If it's over the water, it's maritime. So there, maritime tropical, hot. This is hot water. Over here, this is over Mexico right there. That's going to be continental because it's on the land and then tropical because it's hot. See over here, this is going to be maritime because it's over the water and tropical because it's hot. This is over Canada. Dry, cold, CP. We did that one before. And then it's going to ask me to do that. Okay. So literally, I just answered the question. So A is going to be continental polar. And we're going to write dry and cold. B is continental tropical. And this is going to be dry and hot. 
And then C is Maritime Tropical. Which is moisture, moist, and hot. There we go. That was easy. Oh man, I'm supposed to be rating these questions. I forgot about that. Let's go back and rate. I like rating. Uh, tornado Alley question. Kind of hard if you don't know the that concept. So that's a 7 out of 10. This direct ray thing... Um, I don't know. That's pretty easy. But again, you had to know the content for that. There was nothing in the reading that could have helped you. This one. So if this graph tells you that as temperature is hot, density is down. So this is actually pretty easy. And then to figure out if the air at the poles rises or sinks, you could have ran to the reference table and you go to this page here, do, 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 right here. See, and you could see um, at the equator, if you look in the Hadley cell here, it's rising up off the equator in both sides. And then at the poles, you could see it's sinking. So like that would be a way you could figure that part out if you knew how to read this chart. If you didn't, by the way, know this, I have a, another video in this playlist that teaches this entire reference table, every single page. So definitely go check that out. So that one is, if you knew that stuff, it's so easy. I would say that's a three out of 10, easy. Again, this is this gives you a lot of the words, but if you didn't know the content, this would be really hard to do. So if you do know the content, though, it's really easy. So I would say if you didn't know the content, this is impossible pretty much. But if you did, this is very easy. I would say that's a three out, three out of ten. And we'll keep going on. The area surrounding Tornado Alley is affected by three different images, uh, three different types of air masses. OK, so now we got fronts. So we got the cold front, warm front occluded front and a stationary front i'm going to run through these real quick before i do the question so here's what we got to know about fronts the cold front this is cold air very powerful the slope is very steep so when it hits warm air it shoots the warm air up that slope and it makes pretty big clouds so you get violent storms but they're very short-lived so you can imagine like a, a blizzard or like a crazy lightning storm things like that heavy rain heavy snow things like that crazy storms but they don't last long a warm front is when your warm air hits into cold air but it goes above it and it takes a long time to go up it so it like crawls up and it makes pretty long clouds so you just get like rain but it's over a very large area so this is going to be like widespread widespread steady rain and then we got occluded front so this is when cold air over here is moving in there's warm air in the middle here and there's cold air also in front so what happens is the cold air smushes the warm air between the two cold air masses and forces the warm air to rise in between it so you just get like storms here like precipitation and then um, a stationary front is when two air masses are like locked together and there's just rain over a very long period of time because it's stationary right it doesn't move long periods of Precip. So that's the idea of the four real quick. So now we got this. Okay. So I have to tell you, I did look at this question in advance and I don't think it's good. So I will go over it and I will tell you why I don't think it's good, but I just, it's not good. So it, it doesn't really work. So it says in the West, a blank air mass is moving to interact with a blank air mass. So in the West over here, you could see the cold air mass is moving into the warm air mass over here. So that's the blue going into the red, right? So this would be a cold air mass is interacting with a warm air mass. This produces, and then you could look at C, it would be a cold front. So this is going to be strong winds and heavy precipitation. We just went over that. Strong and heavy. So, so far we're good with so it should be cold, warm, heavy, hail, high winds. That's this one. Yeah, this is the best because you want crazy storms for cold front. Anything to start with warm is wrong. And then it's not a cold front hitting a cold front. So that's automatically wrong. So we already know the answer is going to be three. However, it's the second part that breaks this. So it says, in the east, a blank air mass is moving to interact with a blank air mass. The problem is... It's like 
In the east, okay, where in the east? Like, like, are you talking about this? Okay, so then it's like a warm air is going to interact with more warm air up here? Or is it saying the warm's going to go into the cold? It's very misleading. The problem is, I don't know what this green even means. They only labeled cold fronts and warm fronts. There's no color of what any of this really means. So that part doesn't help. So I don't even know what this is. So, and then the only answers for this could be a warm moving into a cold. So that would be a warm front, which moderate to light rain slash drizzle is, is an okay answer. I just don't really agree with this map. I, I just think it's kind of a mess. So three is the only possible answer though. So we're just going to go with three and that's my rationale. So, well, I'll give it a six out of 10 just because it's, it's hard to figure out. But really, if the question was had a good map with it, this would be a super basic question. Like, just to know the difference between the fronts is like a 2 out of 10 in difficulty. So I would say, yeah, that, that's all I got to say about that. Okay. And we got Tornado Alley. Flat terrain, perfect spot for supercells to develop. So a supercell is a long-lasting thunderstorm that rotates and produces strong winds and eventually forms a tornado. So they show the sort of effect on how the air turns into a tornado. And it says what data would meteorologists need to collect in order to predict a tornado formation. So you could see like a couple things. So we need warm, moist air. So that's like temperature and moisture right there, humidity. Air upwards is pushed upwards, warm air upwards. So that might be pressure. Um, we don't have that as an option. So we definitely like humidity and air temperature. Look, speed of the winds, 150 mile an hour wind. So we need wind speed. And then air upwards, air forced back down, causing a tornado form. So really the wind direction would be good because the wind direction goes in all different directions. So I would say those. The rest of these don't make any sense. Precipitation total is not going to help us predict a tornado formation. Past tornadoes occurrences, that could be useful to know, but it's not going to help us predict a new one. So that's not that good. And composition of the air, this is not going to help air. We already know the composition of air everywhere. It's like mostly nitrogen. So I would say one, two, three, four. I would say it's a five out of 10. So it says it's sometimes hard to see a tornado because wind is invisible. Meteorologists use a Doppler radar to track severe weather, including tornadoes. These emit radio waves and measure the changes of frequency as they bounce off precipitation particles like rain, hail, or snow. This allows meteorologists to determine where the precipitation is occurring and characteristics of the wind within a storm. When examining radar images, meteorologists look for a hook-shaped pattern in the storm, which can indicate that a tornado is forming. Okay, which weather radar has a showing tornado forming? Okay, so we got to look at these. So it says we're looking for a hook-shaped pattern. Um, that looks like a blob. That looks mostly like a blob. It's got this thing. I don't know. Oh, look at that. And that's a blob. Look at that. Boom. Look at that. This, this hook. That's the hook. Oh, so that's choice three. That was so easy. That's a, literally a one out of ten. That's so easy. There's your hook. All right. If you have clusters that your teacher has sent you, feel free to, you know, comment or email them to me or link me things. I will definitely go over any questions that you send me. That's no problem. I can make a video just for you. So I hope you enjoyed these, you know, hit the bell, all those good things, share to your friends, and I will continue to make videos. Keep a lookout and good luck studying, and I'll see you soon.